I'd like to spend our next 20 minute sprint here talking a little bit about some of the advancements in the area of robotic automation. Uh, because for some of us, this opportunity is going to mean a, a, a big performance improvement. And for some of this, this opportunity is going to be a very large threat. So again, I think a lot of people are going to hear two different presentations as we go through this today. But specifically in manufacturing, when I say the word automation, I think everyone's mind goes to this stuff. They think about automation on the factory floor and the logistics operation, autonomous vehicles, all of those things that are coming in and continue to mature and of course are transforming our business. But these are not the forms of automation that I want to talk about today. Specifically, I want to talk about automation of the knowledge worker. Now this term knowledge worker is really a very broad term and what it specifically applies to are those folks in your organization today that spend almost all of their time in the digital domain. Now, we're in that, when they're in that digital world, they're primarily doing a few different things. One, they're executing and running all your processes. Number two, they tend to be extracting data, building reports, running analytics, making decisions that ultimately become transactions or actions in your business. And they also spend you know, a large portion you know, of their time solving issues, fighting fires, whether those fires are with your suppliers, with your customers, or certainly in the four walls of your factory. So in simple terms, that's who this knowledge worker is. Now, up until this point, they have largely avoided automation because of the complexity of the tasks that they do. The knowledge worker has to access and log on to lots of different systems to get to these decisions, process lots of data, often take, oftentimes making decisions that have a subjective nature to them. But today, technology has changed all of that. And I know when I describe this type of automation, there's a picture that I think most of us tend to get in our, head, get in our heads around what this looks like. But I can guarantee you that automation of the knowledge worker does not look like this. Matter of fact, automation of the knowledge worker is not physical at all. It's actually done by software. There's a couple unique things about these new software packages that, that have really come into fruition recently. The first one is this software runs in your user interface environment of your IT architecture. What does that mean? Just like a human logs in and accesses lots of things from the desktop of their computer, that's actually where this software runs. The second thing that's unique about it is the software isn't developed in like typical coding applications that most of us are used to. In this software, you actually train bots. And what that means is you can train them in a very highly customized fashion to the way you run your business. So they're not coming out of the box pre-configured or pre-coded. You really get the flexibility to build them the way you need to run your processes, the way you execute your transactions, the way you want to see your data. The third thing about these bots is they actually sit on-prem. And since they act and mimic what a user does, they have to follow all of the same security guidelines that your information technology uh, side of the house is already built in. So there aren't a lot of big security issues when you go to implement these softwares. So I think what, that's one of the things that makes them very flexible. But what I often need to do to explain this is to show you a quick video. And really that video will try to bring to life kind of a very simple bot doing a supply chain task. So let's spend a few minutes watching that.
Okay, well, hopefully that brought to light a very simple example of what I'm talking about. But what I just showed you is really what is called the world of process automation. And really what this is, is the use of these technologies to essentially automate repetitive manual, very structured and very logical tasks. What you saw there simply was a bot that received an email through OCR, it interpreted that email as invoices, it took those invoices, processed them, and put them into the workflow process to be approved. Typical process every single one of our companies have, and typically you, know, you probably have you know, 100, if not a few hundred folks doing those types of tasks every day. Lots of other things fall into this category of process automation. When you think about any report that is generated with data manipulation, another fantastic target for what process automation can handle for you. Uh, other great examples, data governance. A lot of companies struggle with data governance. It's highly manual. Process automation is an area where you can have some of these soft bots continually running those processes for you and finding bad data, cleaning bad data, not allowing bad data to exist in your system. When you think about all of the processes in your finance organizations, supply chain, even in your aftermarket organizations, many of them are very repetitive and very structured, and they're actually well documented. And that's really where this technology and what's called process automation fits. But that's not really the end of the journey. Because for a lot of companies, you'd say, yeah, I, I have some work that meets that profile, but you know, maybe it's 5 to 7 to 10% what I, of what I do, but not a, large, not a large portion. But there's actually a more complex domain that sits within this space, too, called cognitive automation. Now, the big difference between you know, process and cognitive is really kind of the difference around things being very situational and decision-oriented. These bots can get much more complex than simply executing workflows. You know, for example, if you are trying to make a determination on whether or not to load a new demand signal, the bot can actually pick up that that request was made from an email. When it looks at that request, there's a big if-then-else statement that needs to get executed. Oftentimes, those if-then-else statements are driven by data analysis or various things that need to get pulled out of the system. You can actually have these bots go through and run that complex analysis, ultimately making a determination and processing that action or making that decision for you, or escalate it to the right individual to handle that type of task. But what it's really doing is building in, of course, kind of the multi choose kind of what I call the choose your own adventure world of running your processes. Cognitive also brings in a much more advanced layer of natural language processing and natural language generation. Uh, in this cognitive space, you can have bots not only triggered by email or by certain things happening in your ERP system, you can use voice and, and other types of natural language to get them executed and running. They also can respond in natural language. So let's say, for example, customers call your aftermarket wanting to know, where's my stuff? Right? The bot can answer that phone, listen to that request, determine what needs to be done, go and search through the systems and find out, is it in inventory? Where is it in production? Is it in shipment? And actually respond to that customer in natural language itself called NLG, you know, and that customer not even realizing that they actually dealt with a bot. Um, there's other complex things in this world, too, where machine learning is applied. Because one of the things about making decisions is it's not always exactly obvious which leg of the if-then-else tree I need to run down. So there's actually packages that include machine learning where it can look at what you've done in the past under similar circumstances and ultimately make a decision on how to process it. So this cognitive domain really brings in a much more complex nature and much more complex workflow. Another big difference between these two spaces. In the process automation world, generally when you evaluate the software in this space, the software package itself end-to-end -end, can handle that process. When you mature, and I often recommend clients start in the process automation world, when you go into cognitive automation, this is where you actually start knitting lots of different applications together. Right? You know, for example, you might have the cognitive automation tool not try to do a regression or an advanced an analysis itself. You might have it go call one of your best of breed tools, feed the information, and then get the response back from that tool. So you start cobbling together lots of different technologies to execute your workflows. So when you get into that space, not only is it more complex from a, a development and training standpoint, it's more complex from the sets of technologies that you put together. Now, of course, as you execute this roadmap, the value that you're able to ca you know, capture continues to, to climb and climb. 
But I want to talk about that value equation really quickly because it's not always obvious all the sources of value you can get from automation. Now, the ones that, are, that clearly you've already heard about is the cost reduction and the speed increase opportunities. You know, clearly bots cost hundreds or usually less than $1,000. So in terms of, you know, when you go head to head with an employee doing something, they're usually less than 1% of what it costs to do that using uh, you know, manual labor. Second, you already saw the 15 to one speed. So you take those two factors into account, the business case is actually built fairly quickly. But that's not oftentimes the problems that you're trying to solve in your business. A few other ones that I wanna highlight, quality and compliance. Uh, when you look at the use of automation in your business, you are able to reduce your error rates almost to near perfection. We've had processes that had error rates in the 60 to 70% range. Once automated, they've gone almost down to, down to zero, right? So improving the quality and the outcome of your processes is certainly one. Compliance is another one. A lot of you have processes today where you need to maintain compliance, either there's some regulation or some stipulation from your customer. A lot of times you have to sample some of the processes to make sure they adhere. The good news with bots is you can make sure every process complies every time because these things are cheap to build. It can run in the background all the time. Process standardization is another fantastic outcome of robotics. Most, most companies are always trying to get more standard, more streamlined processes. Once you get an army of bots executing your processes, they do it one way and it's right every time. Uh, in addition to that, you get increased uptime. Now, this isn't always particularly valuable inside the four walls, but it really matters to your customers. Having a 24 by, 24 by 7 service channel when someone can feed a request and get a response can be very powerful. I've seen circumstances even where plant managers want this to ask simple questions like, where am I in my build status or how much product was built today? But these bots are ways you can up your response time and, and your response um, frequency uh, for lots of different stakeholders. Scalability is a big one. A lot of us in manufacturing have peak times and have valleys. What's great about bots, when you need them, you turn them on. When you don't need them, you turn them off. So imagine having a fully scalable workforce at any time on demand, very powerful. There's also been a big move around reshoring. When you look at this automation, a lot of folks outsourced various processes, sometimes you know, over the pond to other countries or to other companies. Now, with this technology, you can actually bring that all back in because you can do it at a fraction of a cost. Matter of fact, when you look at most sourcing efforts today for services that you're outsourcing, one of the big questions is what type of automation is that client doing? Matter of fact, chances are service providers you're using today, they're already automating their processes and their profit margins are growing quite large because you're assuming they're using some type of lower class labor. They're actually using machines to do that type of stuff. So again, a great opportunity for clients to bring things back within their control and not have to pay for them. A couple other benefits, you know, higher job satisfaction. This one is not as obvious, but certainly when it comes to the millennials you know, that who look at some various jobs, the repetitive mundane portions are very unattractive. So we've actually found the use of this technology where you really can sweep off the plates a lot of that repetitive manual stuff and really get the jobs focused on the much harder, kind of more important tasks that you want your humans doing and are worth the, the kind of rates you have to pay them. So job satisfaction can actually increase on average and it can be actually a big boost to your culture overall. And of course, improved decision making. You know, the biggest problem in decision making is subjectivity in humans, right? Once you get these technologies in there, you're able to do things in a much more kind of standardized fashion and certainly with the outcomes that you'd like. So I want to talk um, a little bit about applicability as well. I think for most, you see the application of this in the back office, right? HR, finance, accounting, tax, legal, certainly IT and the data management sides. These are all great places to start with automation, but this isn't real the real opportunity sets. You know, much like the robots you put on the factory floor, typically they were displacing some of the lowest labor classes that you had within your factory. Same thing happens with automation. Obviously you go after back office because it's standard and repetitive, but it isn't really where your journey should stop or the vision you should have on your journey. Because the bigger applications and more of the value actually sit in the heart in your business. And that's supply chain, operations, and, and aftermarket. And, you know, these are the areas where freeing up capacity, improving response rate, driving standardization, having 24 by 7 support levels become particularly valuable. But it doesn't just stop there. There's lots of applications in the engineering and product development space. Now, I know what most of you, most of you are saying. I'm not going to automate away in an engineer. And I'm not recommending that you do so. 
But if you went and studied the activities that your extremely capacity constrained engineers do, I'm willing to bet you're gonna find 30 to 50% of their time is running reports and doing very mundane things or processing engineering changes. All that can be automated, freeing up a ton of capacity and capability within your organization. And I've mentioned this one a little bit, but the most advanced companies are using this on the customer side of the equation. Not only are they using it to drive customer support, but a couple of companies we've worked with have created whole new service models that their customers are willing to pay for, and it actually helps differentiate their product uh, in the market. And again, all of that driven by automation. So when you think about what process automation can be, you might start in the back office, but think of how it applies in the heart of your business and certainly in the front office of your business. Now, with anything comes challenges. And if I didn't speak about a few of these, um, certainly, certainly you'd be critical of my presentation. But like the Skynet reference before, you have to be careful with robotics and robotic automation. The bots can go crazy, right? The biggest issue we see here when people touch and feel the software is their first goal is let's, let's federate this and put it on everybody's desktop in the organization and let them start automating what they do every day. That's usually a pretty bad idea for a couple reasons. They get up and go on vacation, forget that the bot is running, suddenly it can create a ton of harm. Second, when you've got thousands of people creating bots, you have no governance over how they're writing that code, the standards by which they're developing that code, and then certainly when you create code blocks that do the same thing over and over, for example, logging on to SAP. When SAP does an upgrade and changes their logon screen, I've gotta go change 400 bots. If I manage this in a much more central fashion using a COE type model, I've got one block of code that I change and it impacts all my bots. So as you start to build these things, you realize that you've got to stand up a whole new capability in your organization, which is really a command center and a development capability around these bots. Now, it's a bit like oil and water in many organizations because the function that runs bots looks very different than anything you have today. It has to be business-led and IT-supported, but they can't be separated into two different functions. You've got to bring those groups together, and then certainly as you move into that cognitive arena, you need to have your advanced analytics or your data scientists actually playing in that space as well. So you really have to stand up this new multidisciplinary organization that oftentimes doesn't fit well uh, anywhere in the business today. And then certainly, lastly, there's the, the big HR challenge or the change management aspect to this. You know, when you automate, capturing value is hard. You need to make that value capture portion part of the program. But secondly, you've got to think about what this does to a manager, right? Today, they manage purely a physical workforce. Tomorrow, they're going to have partially physical and partially virtual workforce. So they're going to have to understand what the implication is on that. You know, you're certainly going to create bots that manage other bots. So you're going to have to understand what that implication is overall in your workforce and how you're going to manage, you know, through that change over time. So I want to close today with um, maybe a prediction or a thought, uh, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll do a bit of crowdsourcing first here before I reveal any of the information. Quick, quick show of hands, how many of you see any application or usage of this in, in your business whatsoever? So a, a large portion. So for, if you put your hands down, how many of those think, you know, interesting technology, maybe it applies to less than a third of my business and a less than a third of my knowledge workers? How many think it's less than a third? One. Uh, how about maybe 50% or less? How many people think this might impact 50% or less of what my company does today? Show of hands. A few more, a few more. How about those who think it's greater than two thirds? You know, 66% or greater. Show of hands. About, about an equal amount. So you guys actually did better than I thought. Um, typically it's on the lower end of that scale. Uh, I don't claim to have the answer or know what the projection is. Um, if you look at some of the leading institutions making these projections, you can see it's anywhere between a third and all the way up to two thirds of your knowledge, knowledge workforce that's gonna be impacted by these tools. Um, so what I can't say is how big, but certainly these numbers lead you to indicate you really have only two choices in this world, disrupt or be disrupted with this technology, and that's really up to you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.